Good morning, everyone. And I, I wanna say welcome to SUNO's 2021 Lyceum Series. Today's event is the Mayor's Summit, Issues, Conflicts, Challenges, and Solutions. And we are honored to have as our presenters two of America's most effective and courageous mayors, the Honorable Latoya Cantrell, Mayor of the City of New Orleans, and the Honorable Sharon Weston Broom, Mayor President of the City of Baton Rouge. Mayor Cantrell and Mayor President Weston Broom, on behalf of the SUNO faculty, students, staff, and administration, I wanna thank you for agreeing to join us for this momentous occasion. I also wanna congratulate both of you on, your, on winning your recent reelection bids. And we wish you all the best as you continue to lead Louisiana's two largest cities and home to four of the five campuses of the Southern University system, the only HBCU system in America. And I also want to welcome and thank our moderator, Emmy-nominated reporter and award-winning journalist, Ms. Gina Swanson, WDSU news anchor right here in New Orleans. And Gina, it is always great to see you. And thank you for joining us today. This Lyceum series uh, here at SUNO has enhanced the student experience for 65 years now. In addition, the surrounding community has been encouraged and enhanced by the university's programming. Lyceum at SUNO stimulates intellectual curiosity through motivational lectures, dynamic entertainment, and uplifting arts. Lyceum explores the richness and significance of African-American history and politics while encouraging our students to become critical thinkers and active participants in political, social, and economic movements. This series hosts leaders who challenge the status quo and promote a social justice paradigm by moving our students to pursue academic excellence. Today's summit will explore issues, conflicts, and challenges such as restrictive voting laws, education, the impact of COVID on our communities, policing, and developing African-American communities. Moreover, the mayors will discuss solutions to address these challenging issues. We're all in for a frank and thought-provoking discussion by two of America's most progressive mayors. And so I wanna thank everyone, our students, our faculty, our staff and administration, our alumni, the SUNO community for joining us and being with us here today. So thank you and welcome. Thank you, Chancellor. My name is Dr. Clyde Robertson. I am the director for the Center for African and African-American Studies as well as an associate professor of humanities here at Southern University at New Orleans. Along with vice chancellor of student affairs, Dr. Adriel Hilton, I am a member of the Lyceum at SUNO committee. Together, we welcome you to our mayor's summit, issues, conflicts, challenges, and solutions, featuring the honorable Latoya Cantrell, Mayor of the City of New Orleans, and the Honorable Sharon Weston Broom, Mayor President of the City of Baton Rouge. The activist, scholar, and public intellectual Angela Davis once said, and I quote, I'm no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I am changing the things I cannot accept. This powerful quote epitomizes, in my opinion, the attitude of each of these dynamic change agents. Both mayors are unflinchingly confronting the major challenges of our time. As Dr. Amons identified, COVID, crime and policing, 
underdevelopment of African-American communities, racism and sexism are the issues that these mayors are confronting daily. Each mayor is tackling their city's major trials and tribulations with confidence and poise. The mayor summit, issues, conflicts, challenges, and solutions allows these leaders to share their intuitions and insights with individuals who possibly would not have had an opportunity to hear them directly. This is also an excellent opportunity for the two black female mayors of Louisiana's largest and most significant cities, an opportunity to share the political platform. We thank you, Mayors Cantrell and Broom, for accepting our invitation and we look forward to your responses and contributions during this meaningful discussion. And now, I'm proud to bring to the podium Suno's compelling SGA president, our own elected official, Ms. Amber Fauché, who will introduce our moderator, Sister Amber. Good morning, everyone. My name is Amber Fouché, and I'm the Student Government Association President of Southern University at New Orleans. Today, I have the honor to present to you our moderator, Ms. Regina Swanson. Ms. Regina Swanson is an award-winning journalist and Emmy-nominated reporter whose career started in news in Monroe, Louisiana, where she anchored the Weekend Evening News. Ms. Regina Swanson is a graduate of Edna Carr Magnet High School, she went to Louisiana State University, where she majored in mass communication, minored in history, and graduated with honors. Realizing there's no place like home, Miss Regina jumped at the opportunity to return to New Orleans. She was offered a reporter's position at WDSU in January 2008, and she's been home and loving it ever since. I introduce to some and present to others our moderator, Miss Regina Swanson. Thank you so much, um, Adriel. I certainly appreciate that uh, introduction. You know, I just kind of want to get right to it when I think about it. And I was asked to moderate um, this morning. You know, I had so many thoughts just because in the last couple of years, we've been confronted with so much, right? So in the last few years, what we know for sure is that the entire world seems to have changed in some kind of way from the upper class to those who are just struggling to get by every day. No segment of the population has been left untouched by what we've experienced. You know, As a result of the pandemic, we're all feeling some kind of effect or another. You know, at the macro level, many of these things that we are experiencing are like beyond the control of our local mayor. You can't control inflation. You can't fix the supply chain necessarily. We, you know, there could be ways we could contribute to solutions. But, um, you know, so many things that we confront are beyond, you know, the purview, if you will, of our, of our mayor. But on a micro level, people are still looking for somebody to do something to make their life easier every day. Like the question that keeps coming up is, how are you working to make life easier and better for families? Simple things, reliable trash pickup and you know, decent education for their kids, getting a living wage, not tearing up your car when you're driving up and down the street, just being able to live without the fear of violent crime. These issues are complex. Um, and you know, people are looking to you to solve them. Whether or not that's what the mayor does, that's what people are looking for at you to do, to make their life easier. Not in sound bites and big ideas necessarily, but in tangible, transformative ways. You know, and that's what brings us here this morning. For me, I am sitting at my kitchen table, so it's where kind of the best conversations and best ideas happen. Um, but that's what brings us here together this morning at this table. Um, because we are confronted with such great challenges um, and it's going to require great leadership. It requires great leadership, like visionary transformative leadership needed now more than ever. So I'm looking forward to this discussion uh, with the Madam's Mayor or Madam Mayor and Madam Mayor President, if you will, with great expectation. You know, uh, it's my pleasure to moderate this morning. And so I'm just going to quickly um, just go through a bio. I know that Mary Cantrell is on her way. 
but I'm going to just quickly hit the highlights. Like, you know, there's so many things I could say about both these women, like trailblazing, historic, we know all of these things, right? Um, that has been widely uh, said and discussed. Mayor President Sharon Weston Broom, um, we know this first mayor, woman mayor president. Uh, she served on the Baton Rouge Metro Council. She was a state representative and a state senator. Um, you know, she's a servant leader, a wife and a mother. And I have to say, when I was a senior at LSU, she was my math com professor. I also was pledging my sorority that semester, so I missed, you know, a couple of classes. However, <laughs> I do remember the fact that it always seemed like you filled up the entire room, like your presence and, you know, thoughtfulness and personality uh, transcended uh, the classroom. And I do recall that. So I always knew that you were, about to, you were going to do something big, you know. And so I certainly appreciate you being here this morning to speak with us. And then Mary Cantrell, um, she is on her way, but you know she also is a lifelong community servant. She, you know, went to school at Xavier, fell in love with New Orleans. Her soul found a home. We heard the story. She just got reelected. We know, we know the story uh, about how she loves New Orleans, and you know she started community organizing, uh, particularly making headlines with the Broadmoor neighborhood, ran for council, um, and then became the first woman elected mayor of New Orleans, wife and mother. Um, and as we said, we were she was just um, reelected. Uh, and so we have two certainly dynamic women that we're speaking with today. And I don't need to keep talking, um, but I just wanted to kind of set the stage for um, our discussion today. We have a lot of pressing issues to get to. And so I guess I'll just get right into it. Um, the first topic that we want to discuss, and I'm going to ask this direct this to Mayor President Broom if you will, you know, COVID-19, I touched on it and how it's impacting everyone in some way. But what has your administration's response been, I guess, to addressing the pandemic on every level, whether it's, um, you know, people dealing with unemployment, people needing to get, you know, vaccinated, ensuring safety in schools, like on every level, like how has your administration had to adjust, pivot and respond to COVID-19? Well, first of all, uh, Regina, uh, it's good to see you again as a former student who is now uh, making her mark in the communications uh, industry. Uh, uh, and let me just say, in, uh, when my colleague Mayor Cantrell comes on, I will certainly, I think we'll have some exchange in terms of uh, mutual admiration because I, I certainly admire her, remember her when she started her journey to become mayor. And it's, it, it's uh, always good to be with my uh, sister mayor and to Suno. Thank you so much for having this meaningful discussion. This is what education is really all about, right? At the end of the day. So let's talk about COVID-19. You know, I first start off, Gina, by saying that um, local governments, municipalities were not designed to handle a pandemic, but uh, here we are, here we were uh, dealing with uh, COVID-19. And of course, we have uh, worked tirelessly uh, to see the decline uh, in COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations. And what has uh, strengthened us and empowered us during this season has been since day one, a community-wide effort. And it has been our collaborations and our public-private partnerships, which have allowed us to reach this point. Let me say this, you know, New Orleans is fortunate, um, Mayor Cantrell is fortunate in that she does have a public health department within uh, city government. Uh, we do not have a public health department in East Baton Rouge Parish or within city government. What we do have is the Mayor's Healthy City Initiative and it was during the initial uh, emergence of COVID-19 that we uh, worked with our hospitals in this area, came together, and then moved forward with a plan of action without any money from the federal government or state government, and just volunteers from our hospital community. And we set up the first drive-through testing site. So we have... Um, it has been extremely important to us here in Baton Rouge um, that we 
recognize the disparities in health, the health disparities that exist, which came to light in a very dominant way during this pandemic. Um, and that we look at what has happened with COVID, certainly address those disparity issues, but that we also use this to address some ongoing systemic issues around health disparities. And so now here we are with vaccines. And of course, we shifted from testing to vaccinations and uh, collaborated with FEMA, our state government, and to increase uh, vaccinations. And uh, we have had approximately 20,000 people who have been vaccinated since April of uh, 2021. And so there was, you mentioned a number of items, you know, certainly the pandemic elevated needs around healthcare, but also elevated economic development needs, right? Uh, we, and so we had to initiate programs like our keep VR serving program to help our restaurants and support them during this time. Uh, we raised over $245,000 for a total of 70 own local restaurants, our business micro grant program, a million dollar micro grant program for small businesses, uh, and our emergency rental assistance program, which is still going. And we were allocated about $29 million for that. And it's good to see my sister mayor who has just joined us. <laughs> good to see you, Sister Mayor Broom. Thank you so much. Sorry good for morning. my tardiness. Oh, we know that you were, uh, have lots to do, a busy schedule, so we certainly appreciate your time. I actually gave um, your introduction already, but I said, you know, they know the story. They just re-voted for you by with 65% of the vote. So people know your story well, uh, and clearly it's one that they uh, support. So I certainly appreciate you taking your time to be with us. We're just talking about, you know, challenges um, that the city has had to contend with or that cities have had to contend with particularly in the last couple of years. So we started with COVID-19 and that we were just talking to um, the Mayor President Broom about how her administration has had to pivot uh, in many ways. And she mentioned, you know, that they didn't really have a health department have a health department, but they, uh, you know, had to pivot to be able to accommodate, um, you know, standing up testing and vaccinations or what have you. Uh, and so I have to put the question to you, Mayor Cantrell. I mean, I, you know, I've seen you take a lot of action when it comes to COVID-19, some popular, some, some not. Uh, talk to me about how the city had to pivot and kind of approach what approach we had to take or what we had to do different to kind of really ramp up our efforts in fighting the virus. Sure, and thank you, uh, Gina. It's good to see you. And again, uh, being with my sister, Mayor Broom. Uh, definitely, you know, the city of New Orleans was that hot spot uh, in March of, of, of 2020 and where the, the focus was on, on our city and not as the overall uh, state at the time. And it required um, me in this role to have to make some tough decisions on the front end. Um, and that was canceling large gatherings as well as um, parades you know, in our community. It was right on the cuffs of St. Patrick's Day. And uh, while that was a very tough decision, you know, and then it was met with a lot of um, uh, anger uh, and dissentment regarding that decision. But days after um, we saw other leadership, the governor followed suit because we recognized collectively that it was the right thing to do in order to slow the spread of COVID-19. Uh, we then went forward into having it shut down, but it was again, the right thing to do. It did have an impact on our economy, on our revenues, we lost a significant revenues, but it was about saving lives and making sure that we did not lose thousands of lives, which was predicted uh, on the front end. One of the hardest things was having to uh, request uh, trailers that would be utilized as refrigerators for our deceased loved ones. And so um, we were leaders on the ground in this at the front of it, and we've been leaders 
um, throughout the state and even the country. Now that we have the vaccine, uh, our numbers are the highest in the state of our residents being vaccinated. And we are at a point where we can be maskless and, and host you know, events and gatherings, which is a testament to the hard decisions that we had to make as a city um, and as an administration, but it's proven to be effective. Uh, we had to make sure also, you know, that we advocated for the resources that we needed um, to fill some of the gaps that we had based on revenue and come up with um, um, innovative approaches to meet our people where they are, our venues, our culture bears and the like. We were disproportionately impacted because our main driver is hospitality and the people who drive that economy are our cultural uh, communities. So standing up a grant opportunity so that we can afford them the opportunity to, to continue to work, embracing the culture and the like. Um, but that was also advocating for direct allocation of federal money. And we saw an influx of CARES Act money that was directed to the state and the city didn't get her fair share out of that, which led us to being on that front, you know, on the front line fighting for ARPA dollars. And so we're now starting to see the impacts as we are embedding those dollars into our budgets moving forward for 21 and into 2022. But we're excited about the future of the city. Mayor Kendra, I wanted to follow up just a little bit on what you said about, listen, I've been reporting that we have seen, you know, hospitalizations go down to the lowest they've been in a while and, you know, a whole bunch of different positive news, particularly when it comes to COVID-19. But, you know, when we look around, we do see cases on the rise in several states, more than 20 states are seeing, you know, a rise in cases. And so as we head into the end of the year, and everybody playing in these big parties and this and that, and listen, I'm supposed to be riding two crews this year. Yeah. Two crews and I already put my money up. So people, you know, <laughs> you know, and everybody is like, oh, Mardi Gras a go. But how difficult, and this is both for uh, Mayor Cantrell uh, when it comes to Carnival, but also Mayor President Broom when it just comes to big gatherings, like when you're watching numbers, you're reporting numbers going up in other states, but yet we have all these plans for big gatherings here. Uh, how do we do negotiate that? That's for oh. me. Okay. For both of you, but starting with Mayor Cantrell. Okay. So how do we negotiate the various events that we're having? I'm sorry. Well, not just that. I mean, it, it almost like does it pretend for our numbers to go back up? If we're seeing nationwide a trend with mm -hmm. more than 20 states right now seeing COVID-19 cases go back up. Does it port, what does that portend for us? Does that mean that we could experience another spike? And if that's the case, you know, how are we planning, you know, we're moving forward with all these big events, like how do we negotiate this process? Sure. So the bottom line is that we've seen this movie before. This isn't new. We've been in this now almost two years. So clearly, if cases go up and we're impacted, then it means that restrictions have to, to be put in place. But to counteract that, from my perspective, is making sure that residents of this community, that we're vaccinated. Um, and also those um, high numbers who are vaccinated are now moving to getting that booster. We need to protect ourselves. And the best way to do that is to make sure that we are vaccinated. We saw this play out in Crew of Boo that we use as an opportunity to determine who was coming to the city, who was vaccinated and the like. And we saw that over you know, 95% of the folks who were um, at the parade were vaccinated. And we also saw uh, with the mandates that we have in place of having to be vaccinated or show proof of a negative test to go to our restaurants and, and participate in many things, we saw an, an uptick actually of people who were visiting that decided that they were going to go ahead on and get the shot. And so we have our, our um, vaccination set up at the airport and the like, but it's all about getting vaccinated to warn ourselves off of any uptick in cases, but we will continue to follow the data, you know, and the science. And based on that, we will make decisions accordingly, just as we've done over the past 20 months. Mayor yeah. President, same question, but also uh, talk to me even about vaccine hesitancy and what you've seen uh, in your community. Yes, you know, um, I'm certainly in alignment with Mayor Cantrell's uh, comments while we open up our cities, uh, our, our businesses, et cetera, we still have to simultaneously emphasize 
the need for our community to continue to get vaccinated, even to, to get tested. Mm -hmm. And um, that, that has to be done as we continue to open up. We can't just relax and say, okay, we've arrived. No, COVID-19 is still a reality among us. And so we are constantly, this Sunday, there's a, a big uh, vaccination event taking place here in Baton Rouge. You mentioned vaccine hesitancy. You're absolutely right. You know, this is part of what we have to deal with in America right now is misinformation, lies, innuendos, all of this stuff. And so we have to, as leaders, counteract that with truth, with data, with medical information, and we have to lead by example. You know, I have gotten, and just as my uh, American Trail has, we've, you know, we've been public with our vaccinations to show our citizens, look, we're just not talking to talk, we're walking the walk too. You know, uh, when I got, I got my booster, you know, over a month ago. And then what we have to do, uh, which is why it's so critical to have these conversations, because you'd be surprised the people who, who uh, embrace misinformation or who have that vaccine hesitancy, you know? Um, so we have to empower ambassadors to share with their families, with their spheres of influence, accurate information about the vaccine. We know as people of color that there is an uh, uh, elevation of vaccine hesitancy because of what has happened historically. I get that. Uh, but that's why it's so important to have people of color help diffuse um, uh, the, uh, the vaccine hesitancy by talking about the vaccine with accurate information, with accurate data. Uh, you know, I, I often say that uh, when I was growing up 100 years ago, you know, my uh, mom and dad took me to get vaccinated. They didn't have a clue what was in that vac uh, vaccine. You know, they did, but they knew this was something that they had to do. You know, my 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 mother talks about some of her talked about uh, some of her family members who died of diphtheria and 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 diseases and, and illnesses that happened back then. So um, I, I believe that we now, even more than when we started, have more evidence that validates uh, the effectiveness of the vaccine recognizing that even though it is not 100%, it is the best mitigator to keep us out of the hospitals and safe and hopeful as we navigate COVID-19. You know, that was, that touched on a lot of levels and I have to make a confession. You know, I was a little hesitant. I'm not even gonna lie. Corey Avery, our medical editor used to be rolling his eyes, like get the <laughs> shot, you know. Um, he's put like, get the bleeping shot. Anyway, so. <laughs> But, you know, so I held out until May, as long as I could, until at work, they were like, listen, if you want to go back in the studio, because we're all separate, you know, in separate places, and, there's, and so they were like, if you want to get back in the studio at Anchor Shows, you need to get vaccinated. So I was like, well, clearly I have to get the shot now. All of that to say, you know, I get the, like, feelings of hesitancy and, you know, having to overcome that in our community, and we've talked about it from a public health uh, perspective dealing with COVID-19, but I'm also interested and the fallout beyond the public health issue. Um, you know, we've seen it just wreck segments of our economy and just wreck, you know, businesses who are, you know, struggling, who, you know, are either have closed institutions in our communities who have just, you know, not been able to survive uh, in the last two years. And people want to know that their mayor or the, you know, city leadership or government is doing something to, uh, you know, help them. Uh, it, you know, maybe if they can't be made entirely whole, something is being done on their behalf. And so can you speak to uh, economically, uh, what has the city had to do or is there been any resources for uh, employers or employees who have totally been wrecked by COVID-19? Sure, I mean, we've had to uh, set up multiple different programs for businesses 
you know, in our communities, those uh, venues, for example, again, the cultural bears, the musicians, the artists, uh, embrace the culture series, keeping them working um, where they're performing virtually, but they're getting paid for their performances, uh, making sure that our restaurants were able to pivot to curbside uh, pickup and delivery and making it to where those curbside uh, improvements and enhancements could be in place for the long haul, uh, ensuring uh, again that um, you have your your business community with different programmatic um, um, and innovative approaches uh, to meeting them where they are. I mean, those things have been front front and center. Even you know your your residents as well. I mean, these are people who live in your community, so faced with you know issues, whether it's uh, assistance with 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 rental assistance, housing, and the like, that speaks to the employee side of things, so that the businesses the businesses can actually function and operate. So it's like you, it's it's a combination of things. When you talk about the business community um, and and their ability to employ, it's also making sure that they have people to employ, and that we're protecting those employees because without them, nothing happens. The city of New Orleans is one of those employers as well, and we never closed our doors. We kept our people, you know, working. Now we did have to face furloughs in the midst of um, this challenging time, but that also led us to fighting for and pushing for additional uh, resources to help our people that came from the federal government, you know, the CARES Act money um, that came our way, and then also pushing for direct allocation where we may not have seen the influx of, of those dollars from the federal level flowing to um, the, the uh, local municipalities. But without a doubt, the partnerships with the business community and helping them stay afloat and with workforce investment dollars, for example, there are opportunities or grant opportunities and funding opportunities where the employer could be paid for one year of expenses as it relates to being able to employ their people, increase the wage uh, for their people, um, healthcare benefits, childcare, uh, equipment, um, as well as um, any type of tools that they may need to um, allow for their employees to work that job. You know, these type of programs have been lifted up. I know within the city of New Orleans, and of course, I've seen that happen uh, throughout the state, and of course, in Baton Rouge as well. Yeah, I, yeah you know, Mayor Cantrell is on point. We um, were able to not only design some of our own creative programs to help our economy here in Baton Rouge, like the uh, micro grant program that I told you about that one of our banks actually helped us uh, with a million dollar uh, micro grant program. And then, of course, uh, our uh, business community helped us with our Keep VR Serving uh, program, but the federal government has certainly um, been responsive. Uh, the CARES Act dollars that she uh, mentioned, emergency rental assistance, and now the American Rescue Plan. We've dedicated money, uh, I think about $2 million from our American Rescue Plan dollars to help uh, address our um, uh, issues with our economy uh, surrounding uh, COVID-19. So, you know, sometimes I, I feel um, that there's a gap in the information pipeline that people don't realize what has been done. That's why we have to take advantage of every platform to reiterate what we have done, what we are doing, and what we're going to do. You know, I think that's a good point because, um, you know, I was listening uh, to read to Mayor Cantrell's speech when she got reelected. And I think it's a good point that you have reinforced when she was naming all of the accomplishments of things that have happened. And I guess I just have a different vantage point because, you know, we get the phone calls in the newsroom from people who feel like nothing has happened, right? Though all of these things are in place and there are all of these resources out there. And so I'm trying to figure out like what that disconnect is and why people are not feeling um, on some level that there is being, that their, I guess, needs are being addressed. Um, I guess there's just a, a feeling of um, people just many times, at least in terms of the calls that we get feeling um, 
I guess that they're not considered or not thought of, like, you know, what has happened to me? I know that you can't address every individual story as a government, you know, but I just think um, you are right. There is a disconnect there. And so what can we do to uh, um, figure that out? Well, let me just say this. We need, um, and I, I don't know what the, what the media is like totally down there in New Orleans, but I know what I have to deal with here. Yeah. So we need media That's right. to be our partners That's right. in getting out information. Right. We don't need media to create store, the story That's of right. the day, right? So for example, yesterday uh, we had uh, an issue around people getting assistance because now uh, our utility company is cutting off um, um, electricity to some of our uh, residents because they haven't paid their bills. Well, in our uh, city parish government, we have our Office of Social Services, and they do help people with their utility bills. But you have to, um, you know, uh, you have to have uh, meet the criteria. Uh, you have to, you know, reach out. But instead of uh, media helping to explain the situation. I agree. They used it as a gotcha moment. Why is yep. the city uh, yep. doing this? Well, you got these people getting their utilities yep. cut off. What y'all doing? What happened? Yep. They, they can't get the money. You know, it's a yep. that doesn't help us. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. That's exactly what happens. I'm not yep. going to lie. Well, we got a lot of people outside of energy who are, you know, got good sound bites and they experience in this. And, you know, this man uh, needed his dialysis machine and his lights got, got cut off and, you know, somebody else paid their bill and they were promised to, you know, have an extension, but they still got disconnected anyway. And it's, it's one of those things, you know, and I talk about this in, in one of my journalism classes, you know, when government is functioning smoothly, nobody has anything to say. You know, when things are, you know, everybody is honky dory, what have you. But the people who have the issue, it's like a squeaky wheel gets the oil type situation. So, yeah, you are right. But I'm not going to say that those stories are manufactured. I am going to say that, you know, we will cover more of that than, you know, outlining all the time every program. Do you know what I'm saying? And so, it, I mean, sure, we can do a better job of, you know, explaining the services that are out there. But I don't want the onus to be completely on the media. Um, I'm just interested in, from Mayor Cantrell, how do you think that we can uh, have more of a connection uh, about what's out there, for, uh, particularly people in the pandemic who are feeling you know, forgotten or left out or what have you, like what can, how can we eliminate this disconnect? Sure, so um, thank, you, you know, thank you for the question, but the reality is that this is a shared responsibility. We're in the midst of a pandemic. It's a public health crisis for everybody. And so when we only focus on one aspect of it in terms of government, we're already missing the mark. And we're not assuming the level of responsibility that we all should. And the media plays a tremendous role in that. Information is key, it's essential. And so when you know something is happening and working or it's, it's available, you can share that information. Understand that your tool and your linkage as well to fill in that gap to where there may be a disconnect. Well, let's fill the gap in because the, the, the resources are real. The programs are real. Now, is there enough resources to go around? We have a resource problem. But that can't come 100% from local government. That's why we lean very heavily on the federal government because the needs outweigh clearly the resources that we have. And especially when the city has taken a big hit financially based on tax revenue. It's not rocket science. But what I will say, this really does call for us to get out of our feelings because we've all been impacted. Yeah. So if we just go on feelings alone, then we're kind of setting ourselves up. We have to go on the facts and point our people in the right direction so that we can meet them where they are. But the reality still remains. We don't have enough resources at all. But I tell you, we're leveraging them in the best way possible. We're now starting to see where we've advocated for a direct infusion of, of ARPA money to where this federal administration understood how we on the ground as mayors were di disconnected from those federal dollars. And so that direct uh, you know, allocation was essential. And that's going to allow us, one, to improve the basic city services, improve and enhance 
um, the resources that we can make available, as well as for the city of New Orleans have demonstrated we've been great stewards of the federal dollars, which has made us receive additional disbursements for our rental program, for example, and where um, there may have been other areas not getting the rental assistance or those assistance out the door faster, but where we are making it happen, the state is reallocating and the Department of HUD are reallocating those dollars to areas that have demonstrated that they're doing the job and doing it at a fast pace. And so we just need partners in this and also to underscore where the gaps are, but also be partners in filling those gaps. And we cannot do it alone. And we did not get to where we are alone. The guidelines that is now allowing us to open back up as a city, but also look to science and data um, that as we move you know, towards hopefully a recovery, we don't want to regress. We want to continue to make progress. And that's what we're focused on um, in the city. I appreciate that, American Child. And I just would like to say for WDSU, we do have a guide of resources and all everything available when it comes to COVID-19. You know, we have covered several of the, you know, efforts or meeting people where they are and, you know, being in neighborhoods. Um, and so I, I think about that in terms of the education piece, because sometimes when you try particularly uh, let's just, for example, say a voter issue. You can try and educate, 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 talk about the good. This will do blah, 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 what have you. And people will still be like, what? And so, um, yes, I know that we have a responsibility to play uh, in getting the word out there. And I just, um, you know, I appreciate every, all the efforts that all have already, you know, been done to help fight this virus. Um, and, you know, what we can do moving forward, because this is also a conversation about solutions and both of you mentioned partnerships. So we have to figure out how we can be better partners. Um, I always say in the newsroom, listen, I don't do PR for the mayor. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so everything is not going to be a, you know, you know, la la wonderland. However, where the city government is doing good, you got to give them props for doing good when they're doing the right thing uh, by people. You know what I'm saying? You got to definitely acknowledge um, what's out there, what's being done and the resources for people. And so we can be a better partner in that way. I certainly, at least on my part, I can't speak for all the our reporters, but I can speak for myself. Um, I certainly am willing to do that if you think um, that's something that will help us get past this. Because uh, that's what this discussion is about solutions. With that, we are going to switch gears. <laughs> we are going to go to our second issue. If there are not any final thoughts on COVID-19 uh, and how the city has had to respond and address the city or, or, or Mayor President Broom, um, any final thoughts here? I think we've covered a lot of territory on COVID-19. Yeah, get vaccinated. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. We are the most vaccinated society in the history of the United States right now. And we've been pre-COVID. So let's get vaccinated and let's move, you know, our, our cities forward and, and protect our people. Okay. Okay, I am going to move uh, to our next issue. I did get a question about COVID-19. We'll circle back to, at the end if we have to, if we you know need to. Um, I'm going to move on to our next issue because it's something um, you know I know that both cities are facing it. it we know when we discuss crime and policing, um, the most pressing issues of crime and policing in the city of New Orleans. We'll start with you, Mayor Cantrell. I know you just uh, left a police department function. Um, I'm guessing we're going to have some new officers on the street soon, uh, which is a good thing. But certainly the rate that we're losing officers through attrition or whatever other reason uh, has raised concern recently. Uh, talk to us about the state of crime and policing uh, in New Orleans. Like, where are we now? And then, I guess, what uh, solutions or what do we have in the works to make people feel safe? Sure, sure. So first of all, uh, we're not uh, losing officers at record numbers. The reality is the city of New Orleans uh, did not hire officers during the previous administration for th over three years. So we're still, you know, impacted by what we did not do 10 years ago. That's a fact. 
So as it relates to public safety in the city of New Orleans, where we have seen an uptick in violent crime over the past uh, 20 months, we are now uh, seeing a trend uh, in the right direction. However, public safety remains that top priority and absolutely leaving uh, this morning, graduating 17 new uh, police officers to our academy. But over the past three and a half years, I've graduated 12 different academies, which is the greatest that we've seen over the past uh, 15, almost going into 20 years under any uh, administration. And we will continue to um, provide adequate funding for recruitment efforts because the city of New Orleans and our New Orleans Police Department are leaders in this country on constitutional policing practices, in addition to the training that our officers are provided. Uh, with that, um, over the past month, I have promoted over 20 captains, uh, lieutenants, and sergeants within the police department because the focus has to be on retention just as much as we talk about recruitment. We want to retain the officers that we have and ensure that when they join even our force that there is a plan and a place for them to be promoted um, and, and realize their career within the New Orleans Police Department. The city of New Orleans had not had a captain's exam since 2003. So under, under my administration, we moved forward with that captain's exam, which led us to promote over 15 captains over a week ago. That is a testament to how we are not only investing in our officers or in our department, but how we believe in making way uh, for officers to grow and for us to retain them. Also, as it relates uh, to equipment and tools and resources uh, for our officers, because we want to remain that department of the 21st century that has the best tools and resources for our officers to utilize. Breaking ground on our shooting range uh, just a few weeks ago that had not been open uh, really uh, since um, before Hurricane Katrina. So that's something that our department has been wanting to have happen under this administration. We've made that happen. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have invested over $40 million in youth and families in our city, creating the first ever office of youth and families, taking a more holistic approach uh, to public safety because we believe that violence is a public health issue. That also moved us into creating the first Office of Gun Violence Prevention, which was uh, launched in April. And also with our Office of Criminal Justice Coordination um, has created many different tools of working uh, with our young people who are system involved. We have an early reporting center, pathways program. You know, I've said when I ran for mayor the first time, nothing stops a bullet like a job. And so meeting our people and our young folks where they are to get the training they need to pivot um, out of uh, violent acts of, of criminal activity. And that's where we are, you know, with the city of New Orleans, investing in our young people, investing also in our police department and closely at retention. But when we talk about public safety, and this is where I think when we also speak about partnerships with the media, oftentimes the focus is only on the police department itself. But in order to keep and make a city safe, it's a team. It's a collaborative approach. It starts, of course, with NOPD, with making those arrests. But in regards to our office, in terms of our office, our officers, they're making the apprehensions. We have the um, greatest clearance rate than we've seen in over a decade, which means that the officers are doing what they're supposed to do. But when we haven't had jury trials in over 20 months, which that has resumed over the past couple of weeks, that's the, the, the criminal justice system working and operating to ensure that justice prevails, that those criminals who are on our streets once apprehended, that they are charged and they are moving through that system and being held accountable. That also speaks to our district attorney that has a role to play in this as well, making sure that our district attorney is um, holding cases and, and, and making sure prosecuting cases that are aligned with violent offenders. So it's not just about the police department itself, although that's a key component, it's really about 
holding individuals accountable who are committing these crimes in our community, which starts with NOPD, but it doesn't end with NOPD. It ends with your DA and your judges making sure that the right people are being prosecuted, the right people are being held accountable uh, to the offenses um, that they render on the street. So it is a um, comprehensive approach. We are believing in prevention, apprehension, as well as intervention. And it takes all of us to do that. And it's, I know my administration and me as mayor, I'm committed to that just in our mid-year adjustments alone, which happened a couple of weeks ago within the budget adjustments for 21, we move forward with uh, enhancements on um, salaries for our senior police officers, which hadn't happened in a mighty long time. That speaks to retention. Also force multipliers that we're funding, whether it's our real-time crime center, which is our intelligence uh, arm in fighting crime, license plate readers and the like, being that force multiplier. And so we are demonstrating our commitment to public safety, but also the New Orleans Police Department has demonstrated on that national stage that we are leaders in this and they're turning to us to departments across the country and are looking to us to how we can help lend our expertise and service. So it speaks to what we're doing and I'm proud of the New Orleans Police Department and eager to continue to be a partner with our criminal justice um, 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 leaders, quite frankly. Thank you for that, Mayor Kentrell. I just would like to say, if I said record numbers, we were losing officers, I didn't mean that, but it certainly was an issue that came up, you know, during the recent like council election races, just uh, about being able to retain officers. I want to get to uh, Mayor President Broom uh, and talk about crime, you know, and policing in Baton Rouge, um, particularly where, where is what's the most pressing issues you're seeing of uh, crime and policing there? Um, and I read recently about uh, an uptick in juvenile crime. I mean, clearly we face the same issues here in New Orleans, but I was just reading recently about a similar challenge in Baton Rouge. Kind of get set the stage for us in terms of uh, crime and policing where you are. Well, you know, let me start off by saying all cities in America, for the most part, let me scratch all a large majority of the cities in America are facing an uptick in crime. And I know uh, when you share that with your residents, uh, it doesn't you know, always resonate with them, but it is a connector. And the connector is uh, COVID-19, uh, especially. You know, obviously, the federal government understood the connection between what was going on with COVID-19 and the uptick in crime, because when they allocated CARES dollars, they said you could use some of that money for crime prevention initiatives. Uh, so, you know, let's start there. And uh, many of the, much of the work that we're doing is similar to what uh, Mayor Cantrell is doing. You know, in September of 2020, I launched our Safe, Hopeful, and Healthy BR initiative. We committed $2.5 million of CARES Act funding to holistically address crime after seeing that significant spike because crime and the, uh, addressing crime is a very complex issue. It's not a one size fits all type of situation. And so through this lens, uh, we focus on stabilizing our youth and our family and our community, creating equitable community development, connects to what uh, Mayor Cantrell said about you know, uh, uh, jobs uh, being a, a, a mitigator to uh, violence, um, expanding health in all policies. And uh, of course, that is directly connected to community-based uh, public safety. And so right now, we have our Baton Rouge street team. And this street team consists of 10 trusted community members with the necessary relationships needed to de-escalate conflicts and steer residents in crisis towards available uh, resources. We just launched our Operation Cleanup Initiative and our Resident Leader Academy to enhance quality of place in our community. And this is a known factor that influences crime. And um, let's talk a little bit now about our police department. 
And so addressing crime is going to not only take, we all know it's the police, it's law enforcement, it's the citizens, it's community organizations collaborating. It's not uh, just the police department, right? And so when I first came in office, um, it was my goal and still remains my goal to move our city, our police department, excuse me, specifically towards 21st century pillars of policing. Uh, that took place during the Obama administration and it's still a very relevant document to follow. And so that has always been my goal uh, for our police department. But of course, when I came in office, we were a community in trauma. Um, you know, recently over the past year, we dealt with the killing, the horrific killing of George Floyd. Well, when I came in office, we had an officer involved shooting that took place while I was running for office with the killing of Alton Sterling. And then we had an ambush of our police officers who were killed. And so we were a community in trauma. And when I became mayor, that came right on in as a top priority for my administration. So I brought our community leaders, law enforcement together to implement some policies uh, that I felt would help close the gap that existed within our police department. Uh, you know, we implemented uh, body cameras. We started a, uh, we implemented a use of force policy that was not in existence. And so we started to uh, address um, those issues surrounding crime. In 2018, I hired a new police chief. And so we were very intentional about uh, addressing issues that exist within law enforcement, as well as simultaneously dealing uh, with our um, with our community as well. And so uh, we have made some strides. Our police have received a 6% raise since I've been in office. They hadn't had a raise in over 10 years. Uh, and we all know everybody wants more and that's a goal to give more, but that's, that's certainly a, a, a start. And, um, and, and so we continue to work on um, reform for our police department. You know, in 2019, we just got out from under a consent decree from my fire the police department and my fire department. And when I talk about reform, Gina, uh, police reform, I, I like for people to understand when you use the word reform, police reform does not mean police rejection. It means I want my police department to be the best police department ever. And we know that there are some obvious challenges there and changes that can be made to help improve our department. And so I, I'm glad now uh, over the past five years since I've been mayor, uh, we have made and can point to data that shows we've made some, some progress. Uh, right now we're, you know, we've uh, got, cameras uh, throughout our city. We're using our real-time crime center, which we looked at from New Orleans uh, to implement here, and that's working for us. We've got citizens who have civic associations who are uh, now allowing us to use their uh, uh, cameras to help us fight crime. So progress is taking place, but we've got to remember that it's so much, uh, so many factors uh, to deal with crime. That's not an excuse, but that's a reality. No, I get that. And I'm, I'm so glad that you um, mentioned that, you know, just nationally, because I do remember um, doing an interview with the White House and they were saying that just homicides in general across the country were up like some 30% or whatever it was. Uh, and so certainly it was a, you know, a, uh, remnant or a effect of COVID-19, just seeing these uh, increases in crime. Uh, but I also think Mayor Cantrell said something interesting about it's just not the police department, but I think uh, that's just what the general perception is, like what are the police doing about crime? Mm -hmm. uh, never putting the onus on you as a citizen or you as a you know person in the neighborhood or you as a parent raising these kids out here. Uh, it's always what the police is doing about crime and what the city is doing about crime. Uh, I did get one question um, from one of our 
uh, attendees today because, you know, I really want this to be interactive. And so I just, you know, this is rel relatively simple for both of our mayors. Uh, is it a good idea to have police live in the neighborhoods that they patrol? Uh, is that something that, you know, is being promoted? If so, like how, what can we do to make that happen? When we talk about community policing, there's no, no better way, I guess, than for officers to actually live in that neighborhood. Any thoughts there, or is that, you know, something that's happening already that we in the media didn't tell people about, um, you know, what, what's your thought there? Well, what I would say uh, to that is the city of New Orleans, the majority of our officers live in the city of New Orleans and they're from the city of New Orleans. We want them to engage community throughout the city. Um, with, with deployment, you can be deployed in multiple areas and you're not just staying in that one district your whole career within the department. So you want your people to be acclimated to every neighborhood in this city and be good in their own skin when they're doing that. Um, and also being able to uphold every step of the way constitutional policing practices. At the end of the day, that's what that's that's where it rests with. Our officers continue to be engaged. Um, and it's you get a force multiplier when they're able to step outside of the neighborhood that they live in. So I, I am in favor of definitely pushing for programs that we are to um, promote um, and build police officers from the ground up. And what I mean by that are, you know, starting to get in our schools early, um, youth uh, programs to where we can expose our young people to public safety arms. Um, we don't just have to look at the NOPD on the front end because we can engage them in fire, for example, the New Orleans Fire Department where they can join at 18, you know, um, the emergency medical services where they can get trained even prior at the age of 18. And of course, being an officer, it's at the age of 21. So there are multiple steps that we can take to help groom our residents here to want to be a police officer. And I think that that's where the rubber meets the road. It's about knowing the community, the culture, and being able to move about every neighborhood in this city and being a part of the fabric of the neighborhood in which they live in, but also the areas in which they serve. One of the initiatives that we just moved forward on in our city actually um, uh, this week uh, was porch roll call. And so you know that when shifts at shift change at the start of the day and in the middle, you have roll call. And so what I have my officers doing now is doing their roll call in the community and on a porch or where a shooting may have occurred in a neighborhood to where they're out there. All of them are in that neighborhood. The residents can hear firsthand how the leadership is um, giving information to the officers that will then start their shifts. And it's just a force multiplier being visible in the community. And I have to say with this starting out in the first, uh, in the fourth district with uh, Captain Dupree, uh, it was really a success, but that's things that we're going to be implementing again throughout the city, having those roll calls multiple times a week and a month but in the community and just showing um, residents that we're present um, and that we're accessible, but that also that we care and we are attached to the community that we serve. Mayor President Broom, should police officers live in the neighborhood they patrol? Uh, is that beneficial uh, in term when it comes to community policing? I will say that I, I do think it's beneficial. I don't know if it is, an immediate accomplishment. I think it, it's a gradual uh, uh, accomplishment, but I think that there can be some, some pilots uh, that take place. For example, uh, while we have not implemented that as a standard, I have had conversations about potential incentives for individuals who live uh, in the parish, right? Uh, I will pick up on what, um, uh, Mayor Cantrell said, a lot of it really has to do too with intensifying our recruitment. I believe that our police department should really be a reflection of the community, right? 
Uh, it, it should be a snapshot of the community. And I will say that I'm seeing that happen more and more. If you have a chance, just look at our last graduating uh, class from the police academy, a snapshot of what our community looks like. Uh, we also have a cadet program that's going on right now where we're bringing in younger men and women who serve as cadets, which helps them transition into um, the role of, of an officer. Um, I love the concept, and I'm probably going to be embracing that roll call concept in the community. I love that. We started off pre-COVID of uh, having community meetings at precincts so people could know where the precinct is, know who works at the precinct. And of course, uh, COVID interrupted uh, that program that we had. Uh, so, I, you know, I believe that the more our officers are part of the community, hopefully the, the better uh, policing we uh, see. But it, it, we do not have it as a policy at this time, but I have been thinking about potential incentives to encourage uh, uh, officers from within the community and uh, within the parish. Mayor President, I'm glad you mentioned the cadet program. We have a comment and a question from Michael Donwin uh, down, down in, in the chat. Uh, he says, one, what about the use of junior policing program? So that speaks to the cadet program that you mentioned. But then he says, um, what about um, things that start with students. I know that uh, American Trial mentioned being in the schools and you know, uh, I know that you've mentioned taking a multi-level, like a holistic approach to this. Uh, Mr. Downen says that he um, has recognized a lack of respect and in student initiatives in the classroom. Um, that he's maybe have, he has an equestrian program that could help kids in Baton Rouge. Like, are you open to innovative programs that could address uh, negative behavior, um, you know, and among students who potentially may be the ones committing crime? Like, how can we, what, what's being done in an innovative way to reach students um, to prevent, uh, I guess, crime or them falling victim to the streets or a life of crime? I'm certainly open to uh, you know all types of programs. We have our Mayor's Youth Workforce Experience Program, which helps, uh, uh, which we engage young people not only during the summer but throughout the year, and put them in many situations that are pre-career oriented, where they can get that experience and also receive uh, a stipend. That's just one of the uh, programs that uh, we have that I believe certainly. Helps as a um, helps as a deterrent um, and a proactive step uh, for our uh, young people. Absolutely, yeah. and I'll add as well. You know, I'm I'm definitely open uh, to any programs that we can we can um, uplift uh, to promote public safety initiatives as well as um, recruit officers. Um, and not just to the police department, but to public safety um, arms across the board. When I think about public safety, it's police, it's fire, it's EMS, and it's homeland security. And, um, and it's, in, it's opportunities that we have as a city you know, to grow and to grow our people uh, into these fields. And so I think about the New Orleans Mil uh, Military and Maritime Academy, for example, uh, where we're partnering with um, to have a great segue in, uh, into these um, pathways of public safety. And I think that's where we're gonna grow our own. And I know that that's near and dear to me, being able to grow our own and promote from within. And I wanna keep that focus, you know, alive. Our police chief uh, is from New Orleans, uh, you know, born and raised public school grad. And he's started as an officer 24 years ago. He's the chief of police. And that's why it was so important for, for um, my administration to begin to look at promotions and creating that pathway for our officers to be promoted. So not just talking about it's a career, but demonstrating it through action that you can actually grow within our department. And that speaks to retaining our officers and not having them leave us to go to other departments when we've invested a, a lot of time and resources uh, into our officers. 
um, a question for both um, mayors. Do you feel safer since you've uh, taken office? Uh, when you look at the situation that you walked into when you took office, that uh, both of you now, uh, well, you uh, were just reelected to your second term. And, um, Mayor President is uh, rounding out her first year and her second term. Um, do you feel safer now um, since you've been in office than you did? Do you feel, do you feel uh, I guess, the result of the policies that are happening, the changes that have been made in terms of police or even in schools or a multifaceted approach, would you say the community is safer now than it was before for both of you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll start first. Do I feel that the community is safer? I believe that the community has more investments in it now um, under over the past three and a half years than we did four years ago, for example, that is making our community safer. So when I think about juvenile crime, which we did have an uptick in that, in the investments that we made, um, retooling our juvenile justice intervention uh, center and putting those programs in place um, that deter um, these young people from going back into a life of crime, I see the results. So it's not about how I feel, it's about tangible outcomes based on the investments that we're making as a city. You can't make it up. And so while I know that there's a need for us to continue to make and keep our city safer, um, I believe uh, that we're on the right path. However, an impact uh, when we've seen even cases thrown out that we would like to see prosecuted. You know, that has an impact, but I do feel that and believe with now the um, the resume of jury trials, as well as in partnership with the DA, that we're moving in the right direction. However, um, we are not free of crime and violence uh, in our community, and that's going to speak to an additional um, set of resources and services and accountability at every level, including the community as well as the media. All of us play a role uh, in doing this and making sure that what's working is being articulated and communicated in a more effective manner. Um, but we do also understand uh, that what when you talk about feelings, uh, Gina, it makes me think about, you know, how when we look at crime and where we see it happening, it's people kind of getting in their feelings and not taking a step back to kind of calm down a little bit before you pick up that gun because you're in your feelings. You know, you got to kind of remove yourself for a minute before you take action, because once you do that, you can't take it back. And so we're looking um, at this very closely and we're seeing as we're doing it and even social media, for example, uh, we've built in another la layer and level of um, in, as an investigative tool uh, with social media and where we see things and starting our beauty and barbers collaborative and working with our, our barber and beauty shops because they are first responders as well. And we believe that with proper training, they'll be able to de-escalate de um, and intervene when they're seeing potential areas of that could get out of control or people that can get out of control. And as a result today, I have barbers once said, you know what, I believe I stopped a murder in my shop, not murder happening in the shop, but having that individual in that chair and speaking to them and saying, look, man, back up. Don't don't respond to that text message right now. Don't 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 get out your feelings about about that Snapchat, you know, or that Insta post. Um, breathe it a little bit. Don't be offended if they post your ex-girlfriend on there. You don't have to retaliate. So it's these types of things that I know that are in the works and that are happening on the ground that are deterring crime. Um, but I believe we're moving in the right direction of being safer. I'm thinking about the examples you just gave, Mary Cantrell, and I know that those have to be true stories because, you know, I've heard and seen that, you know, things, similar things play out, you know, over a text message, somebody would be in the feelings and next thing you know, a tragedy yeah. uh, occurs. Uh, I just want to say this, and then I, I want to get to Mayor President Broom. You know, I feel like there's going to be a running theme here between the data uh, that is happening and the programs and resources that are out there. And then from my perspective, from my end, what, you know, we are getting.
understanding or feedback we're getting from people in the community. So I get for you uh, as a t uh, the chief you know the chief executive of the city, it's not about feelings. It's about the data, what works with the investments, the resources, what have you. Um, but uh, you know the stories we hear about you know carjackings and this and that mm -hmm. there's a feeling people get of unsafety at times sure. um and so i just you know and so again if we can figure out how to alleviate that disconnect but once people experience things they're going to have a you know a feeling of mm -hmm. you know wow i can't believe this happened to me um and so i just wanted to kind of leave that thought out there because i feel like this is going to be a running theme i wanted to get to mayor president broom um we have a question uh, from Crystal Ellis, she has uh, two questions. This is about, you know, still crime and policing, um, but she was asking, uh, are there any avenues or mechanisms for young people to have positive engagement uh, with officers? A lot of times that they have uh, developed a negative kind of a perception just because of a bad interaction they may have had with police. What um, is happening for the good interaction? And that may be the cadet program we could talk more about um, and then also, um, have you seen in Baton Rouge an uptick uh, with crime against uh, women and children? And again, this also is a nationwide issue, I understand, but specifically in Baton Rouge, uh, what have you seen in that regard? So kind of a two-parter, uh, young people having a positive interaction with law enforcement and then um, crime as it pertains to women and children. Yeah, so first of all, um... We do have the cadet program to um, have that relationship. My chief also has a community advisory group and that is open to uh, adults, young people, et cetera. And he does have a diverse group. Uh, so in addition, we have our PALS uh, public, uh, I'm sorry, Police Athletic League where there are positive uh, interactions taking place for young people. So we do have opportunities uh, for those positive interactions. As it relates to the uh, violence against women and children, indeed, we are seeing an uptick uh, of violence against uh, women and children. Here we have had 11.9% uh, of our homicides are domestic violence related. Now, uh, it has, you know, any death impacts me as the leader of the city and parish. And I tell people all the time, whenever there's a homicide, uh, part of the protocol is I get a phone call. So it doesn't matter if that homicide takes place at 1 p.m. or 1 a.m., I'm going to get a call. But of course, most recently, I have personally noted without the substantiating data that we have had an uptick in domestic violence uh, incidents. And so I have reached out to domestic violence advocates because I do think that we have to intensify our efforts to prevent this from happening. And a lot of it, well, I don't like to use broad statements like that. Some of it takes place in the judicial system. There's something that's not, that is, that's part of it. Some of it is, you know, We've got to get um, uh, uh, help for individuals. We have to continue to elevate awareness in terms of uh, escaping, how you escape uh, abusive situations. But then we've also have to, we also have to put mechanisms in place uh, for people once they make it known that they are a victim, that they don't continue to be a victim because there's something broke in the uh, judicial system. When I was in the legislature, um, it took me several years to pass a, a bill that impacted victims of domestic violence uh, from being uh, evicted from their apartments or their homes because an incident took place. Then you have a whole family out on the street, a victim, uh, because an incident took place. So my goal is to collaborate with those who are specialists and experts in the area, see where there are some gaps that exist within the judicial system. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm often told about, and I'm just gonna be candid and transparent, I'm often told about the ineffectiveness of restraining orders. Well, that shouldn't be. Why is a restraining order not effective if it's part of the system? And so um, 
those are some thoughts that I have just about the um, domestic violence that is going on. Um, and uh, it, it is real, the, the numbers substantiate. Just for both of you, because this is breaking news just coming in and it made me think about um, crime and policing um, because it seems particularly when we think about George Floyd and what we've seen in the last couple of years, um, it made me think about how there is a racial undercurrent to how uh, communities of color are policed or, you know, the relationship with policing. We just saw that Kyle Rittenhouse uh, was acquitted, um, you know, and and we know the situation there, uh, killed two people and injured someone else um, while attending a, a protest um, in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, but we think about uh, if there are racial disparities when it comes to policing communities of color, and if that exists um, within our police departments in Baton Rouge and New Orleans, and if that's a, a conversation that's ongoing um, to eliminate the disparities, if they if they are there, or what's being done to address um, any concerns there when it comes to co policing communities of color, Mayor President. Well, yeah, I, listen, I, you know, of course, I didn't know uh, the breaking news until you just told us, and uh, I'm just trying to tune in and see what's going on myself. But, um, you know, let's face it, and, 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 and this is a real conversation. We know that there has been uh, major challenges in uh, policing communities of color. While this certain this situation is not necessarily applicable in this in, in terms of a community of color, uh, but nevertheless, uh, we do know that you know uh, we've got the um, Mabry case going on uh, uh, right now in uh, in um, Georgia that's taking place, and so we know that this has been a challenge for America, all right? Uh, and so I believe, and I know I can speak for, my, uh, for, for Baton Rouge, is that my police chief has been very intentional about making his officers and providing training for his officers so that they understand um, uh, and move towards a different mindset of uh, policing communities of color. You know, Baton Rouge and New Orleans, we, you know, we're uh, predominantly a community of color. And so um, then it becomes incumbent upon our, uh, our officers to, to understand that. And, and I'm trying to think of the uh, training that um, my, my chief um, uh, has initiated um, with the department, it escapes my mind uh, right now. I'll think of it before we get off of, of, of this call. But at any rate, um, uh, it, it is tuned in to, you know, um, prejudice and uh, your, your own uh, prejudice that you have as an officer that, imp that impacts your ability to uh, police. And From so, bias. I'm sorry? It's yeah, you just, bias yeah, training. explicit bias training. That's exactly what it is, yeah. And so uh, he has implemented that. So we have to have training. It, it, it's, 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 it's important and it, it, it's a must that we have training so our officers understand uh, the impact uh, that they have in terms of policing communities of, of color. Uh, Madam President, I just wanted to add this. It's not lost to me, and you mentioned it, uh, that you walked in, you know, right as Elton Sterling happened, um, you know, and that was, that predates the social unrest that we saw last year. Uh, Elton Sterling happened, then the ambush happened, so I know that, you know, this has been uh, on your plate since the very beginning, um, you know, Mayor Cantrell, I, I, you know, we saw, um, you know, just all of the unrest that happened happen, you know, uh, that has uh, since the George Floyd death. So maybe the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, acquittal is not directly related, but indirectly, uh, it was all a result of the social unrest that we saw, um, and particularly people calling on police departments and law enforcement to do a better job when it comes to, uh, you know, how you handle communities of color. What have we done in New Orleans? I know we're a predominantly Black city, but I'm not going to act like we don't have um, racial issues that can sometimes arise. Uh, and so I'm just I wouldn't saying, say that. 
What I will say is that what we saw is that the New Orleans Police Department, again, on that national stage, while we had protests, we were not a community like we saw across the United States of America. And there's a reason for that. The reason being is because our officers continue to engage the community. They are officers officers of color, the majority, but they also live in this community. They understand the nuances of this community, the culture, which is different than in any other place as well. But that's why you saw um, our officers standing tall um, as it relates to what we also experienced uh, here in the city of New Orleans. But also, you know, in, a, in addition to that, we know that our department has been under a consent decree since 2013. We've also seen under my administration how we are moving towards substantial compliance, which speaks to this department being one of constitutional policing practices to where we're looked at as the leader in this country. That's not a false statement. That's the truth. So we have to embrace what is really real on the ground and for the improvements and the investments that we have made that have gotten us real results. And we see that today. Ethical policing is courageous. Epic was created by the New Orleans Police Department. That's now being taught around the country. That was before we saw the, the unrest. We know that police brutality is absolutely real in the United States of America, no doubt about it. We also saw the impacts of that in our community post-Katrina and even you know pre-Katrina. But we've seen tremendous growth that where we're a department, like we, we are no longer carrying that luggage from the past but we're moving our department forward and bringing other departments across this country along with us. When we saw the protests, the A can't wait, we didn't wait. We had already implemented not only the A, but an additional three. So, you know, we're well ahead of the game. And I think we have to acknowledge again, the progress that has been made because it also, speaks to the officers that we depend on to keep us safe. So if we dumb down the progress, you're actually dumbing down the work that they're doing and, and providing us in the community. And it really is a balance. And we have to understand that. When you talk about the department, you're actually talking about the men and women that we depend on. So without you know really being intentional about how we speak about it, you can either boost morale, or you can take a bite out of it and lessen the morale, which will have an impact on us retaining officers, as well as officers saying, you know what, I'm out of here because I don't get the respect that I deserve when I'm putting my life on the line, my family's life on the line to protect and to serve. And so I think it, it all kind of comes together as being one under the umbrella of constitutional policing practices and we're leading you know, on the front lines in that. And we're gonna to continue to put our best you know, foots forward. You know? I have to say, Mayor Gintral, I just wanted, I didn't wanna be misunderstood. When all the social unrest was happening, I wasn't trying to imply that our police were in any way adversarial with the community mm -hmm. because I did see many times them standing shoulder to shoulder with people uh, expressing their right uh, to protest. I also have to say, um, you know, we, we have seen New Orleans lead the way when it comes to body cameras. Um, I remember years ago, New Orleans being among mm -hmm. the first police departments to implement the full deployment of body cameras. So there mm -hmm. definitely are a lot of measures that have been put in place to, um, you know, to uh, be progressive mm -hmm. uh, in, in modern constitutional policing. I appreciate both of those uh, both of the of those responses from Mayor Cantrell and Mayor President Broom. We're going to move on to the next topic. So many people have questions about crime. We could, you know, do the whole thing on crime, right? Um, but we're going to move on to the next topic because it's one that's important when we talk about our uh, our communities. Uh, and you know, it's about the fact that you know our uh, cities are you know heavily minority cities. But what's being done? for minority communities and minority neighborhoods uh, when it comes to un uplift the underdeveloped 
uh, parts of uh, the community. I'm gonna start with Mayor President Broom here. The question is to you, what efforts would you say are being made to areas that may have been uh, marginalized or underutilized or that need to be revitalized, if you will, um, you know, or even areas that seem left behind. And we're talking specifically about African-American communities and neighborhoods. Yes. When I um, ran for this position and I went around the community, although I had been a part of this fabric, uh, part of this community for, for decades, uh, I heard from constituents in areas of disinvestment uh, in terms of their dissatisfaction and their desire to see investment take place in disinvested communities. I made that a priority. And then when I was elected, I, I have kept it as a priority. Sometimes I get celebrated for that. Sometimes I don't get celebrated for that. Sometimes people say, oh, all you care about is North Baton Rouge or this. But you know, I heard uh, someone uh, say this morning, I just left an economic development um, uh, meeting before here. And they were saying, you cannot, which is my message, you can have, not have part of your community uh, succeed and another part uh, not succeed. And you think you have a great city, you, you're deceiving yourself. I always use the analogy, you cannot have part of your city at an A grade and part of your city at a D grade and think everything's okay. You got to get that D grade up. So if the A grade is already up there, you know, let's work on the D grade so we can get it up. And so that has been uh, something I've been very intentional about is the investment in disinvested communities and uplifting those communities. So for example, uh, some of the things that uh, we've uh, done. When I came in office, there was an initiative to have a bus rapid transit project uh, on a short corridor between downtown and LSU. Um, I felt that that was uh, unacceptable. And so what we did was we couched a bus rapid transit program within uh, our um, uh, major project on a major corridor in North Baton Rouge, the Plank Road Corridor Project. And uh, now we have a nine mile route that's going to stretch from Baton Rouge, providing high quality um, transit from North Baton Rouge, downtown, then all the way to LSU. And uh, before that wasn't taking place, we have the Plank Road Corridor Project, which is going to be a major reinvestment in a disinvested area of uh, our community. And so uh, let we, actively, and this is something I, I like for pe pe people to know, Gina, this work just doesn't happen, you know, and it's, it, it, it takes intentionality, you know, closing the grocery store gap takes intentionality, it doesn't just happen like that, and making sure that there are, uh, there are, um, at, there is access to health care in disinvested communities takes intentionality. So for example, we were working on a uh, a project in North Baton Rouge, the Howe Place um, uh, facility had been empty for 15 years. And uh, we started reaching out with intentionality to potential partners. We found somebody to purchase that building. Then we found uh, people to uh, be tenants in that building. Now we have a major Oshner presence there in that building. We have a mental health presence there in that uh, building. We have an ophthalmologist and we created jobs. We put a building back into commerce. We provided access to healthcare and other resources and we created uh, jobs. So we continue to make the focus on underdeveloped African-American communities a, a, priori a priority. You know, uh, Mayor Cantrell in New Orleans already had a active DBE program. When I came in office, they had not even uh, uh, done a disparity study. The, the council told me they had been trying to get a disparity study done for 10 years. Well, you cannot stand up a DBE program if you don't have a disparity study done. So we were able to get a disparity study done. And as a result, uh, we, uh, the council approved my proposal to establish a division of supply or diversity within city uh, parish government. You know, we, we've got Amazon facility coming that's going to create a thousand new 
uh, and full-time jobs right in an area of uh, disinvestment. We've got workforce development going on through our employee VR program to provide career training. So we are honed in to lifting up disinvested communities in a variety of ways. And those are just some of them. I appreciate you saying that, you know, um, these things don't just happen about the intentionality that it takes, the intentionality, the diligence uh, also, uh, you know, it's not an easy job. I don't envy for either one of you, I'm not gonna lie. Um, you know, there's so many things to address all at once. Um, at Mayor Cantrell, you know, people, you know, always talk about New Orleans East and, you know, what, what we're going to do with all our big box infrastructure and how are we going to, you know, breathe new life into this area mm -hmm. uh, or even uh, lots of different parts of the city. Uh, mm -hmm. People want to see, uh, you know, more investment, more activity. Uh, tell us what the Cantrell administration is doing to uh, address these concerns, specifically, you know, in African-American neighborhoods. Sure. Well, the city of New Orleans is majority African-American, as you know. And areas that you mentioned, New Orleans East, Lower Ninth Ward, uh, parts of Algiers and the like, um, are ripe and prime for reinvestment. That's why um, when I came in, one of the first orders um, that I really initiated was just assessing where do we own land, city owned land? Um, how could we use our land that we own to incentivize redevelopment and economic growth? as well as pivoting to growth sectors that are in the city of New Orleans, shying away or moving away um, from hospitality, playing to that strength, no doubt about it, but diversifying our economy so that we're less dependent upon hospitality as being that main driver. And we saw uh, the impacts during um, COVID-19, quite frankly. But for the first time in over 16 years, I restructured an RFP and an RFQ process for the Six Flags site, for example, uh, and finally having a viable and a credible uh, developer uh, that has now uh, been selected and we're working to move the redevelopment of that site forward, which will be catalytic in creating jobs and, and future growth and playing to our strengths in regards to science and technology and math and just our geography. It, it, it makes good sense. We have NASA in our backyard, um, bioscience, we're growing in that regard. We have to, again, play uh, to that strength. As it relates to infrastructure improvements in our city, uh, again, this is the time, and we've demonstrated that we're um, investing in our communities, all communities, quite frankly, but absolutely African-American communities, but growing jobs of the future, which is tied to green infrastructure. You know, those are real sustainable jobs that we are creating, and we need more of them, more of our workforce trained to sustain the investments that we've made. Now is the time for that. We're right uh, for it in our city. As it relates to uh, investing in home ownership, uh, we're still a city of majority renters, but under my administration, we've leveraged over $20 million for affordable housing and, and set aside an additional $5 million for down payment assistance, moving our people out of rentership, but into home ownership. And with the real focus, Gina, on New Orleans East, those soft seconds that we provided residents with, which is the best contract that I love to sign, it was done intentionally, as Mayor Broom said, we have to work through that lens. And what that means for not only those families that we're putting into homes and homes that they can afford and that are resilient uh, and that are energy efficient, but also it allows the city to demonstrate to those investors that you want to attract, to those developers that you want to attract. This is how the city is also investing. So we're not just wanting you to come take a risk on us, which we do, but we're also lessening that risk because we're demonstrating that we're investing in our people and in those areas that we want you to come on and invest in as well. We're also um, making sure that we picked up multiple cans that have been kicked down the road for decades in the city of New Orleans. That's not only, you know, tied, it's a lot uh, tied to, to infrastructure, but it's also tied to how we are diversifying and pivoting our people into other uh, growth sectors. So like 
Ida, I mean, not Ida, with, with COVID, we were able to, for those former employees of hospitality that may have been out of a job, we invested in a workforce training opportunity, training them into tech sales and letting them know that yes, your skill sets in hospitality are transferable. As you pitch that dessert, as you pitch that special, as you pitch that drink, as you worked on recruiting you know, and, and, and serving uh, those coming to stay at your hotel, that same level of experience transcends into tech sales. And now I'm so happy to say that our first pilot and our first cohort of 10 are now making $85,000 a year in an upward of $125,000 a year, real sustainable jobs. And so you're getting people to understand that it's real because a part of the challenge when you have these programs, people count themselves out in their feelings, counting themselves out. But we're not counting you out. And we're saying these things are real. We're wanting to connect you to these resources so that you can ensure that you can create transferable wealth, but also launching a series of initiatives to address the racial wealth gap in this city. And hopefully pushing even that hospitality industry of paying our people what they're worth. And that's what we've learned through this pandemic. You gotta dignify people. Now, you know, it's not that they don't wanna work, but they recognize their value and what they mean to society because they are constantly on the front line. So. This is where and why the city of New Orleans, hey, we're raising our minimum wage to $15 an hour. That's a part of the proposed budget submitted to the New Orleans City Council so that we can be the example, again, government, but hoping to push the private sector of doing the same thing because our people matter and they're worth it, especially if we're depending on them to provide a service I'll launch the Crescent Card Program, connecting our most vulnerable residents with meaningful financial equity, you know, that link uh, to a MasterCard. Uh, so whether or not they're returning citizens, when they leave jail, they get a check, they don't have an ID, but they can get this MasterCard. It has their, their picture on the back. They can use it as ID, that 20 bucks uploaded on that card and other incentives that will be loaded on that same exact card. But it also speaks to uh, the vulnerable population, our youth 16 to 24, that will be a part of this pilot, 275 of them. I've signed up and have received resources for mayors for guaranteed income over a 10-month period, we'll be providing uh, resources to these individuals. We'll be uh, watching them. We have a partnership with Tulane as we will be measuring the effectiveness of this program. What we do believe that if you meet, meet them where they are with a little bit of resources, that they're going to do the right thing to pull themselves up and to pivot towards a, a greater, a greater um, uh, opportunities uh, so that they can sustain themselves. Also in terms of workforce, because our workforce office job one has performed so well uh, in the state, we have been able to get additional grant dollars um, because we're activating those dollars and training our people for jobs of the future. But let me tell you, there is no better time than now. We have a window of opportunity. We need the federal government to push that BBB, you know, meaning, um, um, you know, that, that, uh, that better, uh, bill that's going on, building back better, because that's investing in our people in ways uh, that will deal with the most vulnerable populations. Our people are homeless, our people suffering from mental health, those uh, that are not, that are unbanked. Um, you know, this is how we are meeting the needs of our people here in the city. And there's so much uh, more that we are doing, but I tell you, uh, we're moving in the right direction. I just have a couple of things I want to say about your comments. One, I would love to talk to the people in your first cohort making the $85,000. I mean, that's an excellent story. Mm -hmm. um, so if anybody can send that my way, that would be awesome. Um, also, you know, you talked about the soft second program. You know, I wasn't always the news anchor at Channel 6. At one point, I was a struggling reporter. I bought my first house with the soft second program. Um, so I definitely know uh, how it encourages home ownership. Um, so I, I appreciate 
uh, you talking about the different programs that exist, but I do have two questions um, and they both tie to the same thing when it comes to economic development, jobs of the future, uh, you know, sustainable jobs, living wages, all of this goes back to education. I'm going to uh, start with Mayor President Weston Broom. I know that, you know, we have duly elected school boards, uh, but to what extent uh, does city government uh, have influence on education policy or what happens in our schools and, you know, what can you do to uh, ensure that our kids, Black children, I mean, all of our kids, really, but we're talking about in, in Black neighborhoods specifically, uh, that we, our kids don't continue to fall behind. Uh, Mayor President Broom, we're going to start with you. Yes, you know, when I came in office, um, I made the statement that while I do not have jurisdiction over the school board, uh, any mayor has to be concerned about education right. in uh, her city because uh, education, of course, is directly connected to quality of life for individuals. And um, so I, um, we have a new school superintendent. And uh, one of the first things I did was reach out to him and we have uh, sat down and we uh, carved out a collaborative uh, work, piece of work that we're going to do together. And we've already started that work. For example, we are both now uh, going to lead a literacy effort here in our city and in our parish. Uh, we also have pulled our uh, school uh, board our school system in to the work that we're doing around building safe communities, our safe, hopeful, and healthy uh, initiative. Um, I personally have implemented a uh, program in the, through the mayor's office called Cradle to K, where we are working on uh, early childhood development because we know that uh, uh, once a child is past three years old, if we haven't already sowed those seeds of, of uh, development, we, we're behind, right? We can't wait till they get to kindergarten. So uh, we're doing that with, in collaboration with our Head Start uh, program and initiative. And so while the mayor doesn't have uh, authority over the school system, we certainly have to be collaborative partners with our school system to help uh, them on their trajectory uh, of academic uh, success. And so you might say that right now, our, our superintendent and I, we're very much connected on a consistent basis. Just recently, he took a uh, group uh, to Miami to look at some of the work that's going on with the, uh, in the Miami school system. And we are now going to uh, uplift our uh, career development initiative through Employ BR after seeing what is being done in, in uh, Miami so that we can uh, put our students on a trajectory of uh, success. Mayor Cantrell, the question is to you, and I just wanted to give a shout out to Amani McCat. Uh, McMaster, who asked this question uh, just about um, education and what can the city do to make sure that our kids don't continue to fall behind? Right. So what the city has done uh, under my administration is creating the first ever Office of Youth and Families. And under that umbrella is our public and as well as our private schools, making sure that we have constant communication, but in a collaborative manner, again, to address the needs of our families, which is tied to our students, no doubt about it. Even as it relates to our public libraries, as well as our, our recreational uh, department underneath that umbrella. And much like Mayor Broom said, you know, we don't have the authority, but we absolutely believe we have a responsibility to it and making sure um, that we are moving in that regard. You know, I led the charge when I was on the New Orleans City Council to invest in early childhood education, and I doubled that investment as mayor. It is my hope over the next four years that we as a city um, will have a, a, a definitely a, a, a funding stream and a source that's dedicated to early childhood education. It is essential. But in addition to that speaks to child care, quality child care that our families need and it matters. And, and so these two things coupled together in addition to programming uh, across the board, it helps our young people 
as we're helping their families. Because you can't, if you don't look at the, the unit, that whole unit, um, then I question how deep we're going. And so our approach is one that is very much comprehensive um, in this regard. And so I am looking very closely at that Build Back Better legislation, but also looking very closely at our educational partners and working with them on a dedicated funding uh, stream for our early childhood education, one of the only cities in the country, you know, that's investing in that way. But we wanted to set the tone um, and also not just talk about it, but demonstrate it through actions of how serious uh, this is uh, for us, you know, as a community. We have eight colleges and universities in our backyard, they're assets in and of themselves. So we have to be grooming our young people to take advantage of these assets as they grow in our community. And so we're just doubling down uh, on our efforts collectively and working with the education community um, that has a responsibility. And that also speaks to, you know, the infrastructure, you know, that we've been pushing very hard for. I know Mayor Broom and I, we were in, in DC, you know, at the White House, witnessing our president signing that legislation because we fought very hard for that. And a part of our infrastructure is also our people with that and, and investing you know, in our people, in technology, in broadband, uh, so that our young people are not disconnected from alternative uh, educational opportunities or initiatives, but they're at the forefront of them. And so we're committed to it. Ed educating our community is a community effort as well. And uh, we all have to be committed uh, to wanting to develop strong, confident young people because they are the future uh, of our cities, no doubt about it, but it's the future of this country. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, we've explored a number of different topics. Um, we're actually about to pivot to our last topic for the day. Um, you know, but but I can't say enough about the value of uh, good quality education and how transformative it is and can be in communities. Um, so I appreciate uh, both uh, Mayor President and Mayor Cantrell um, making sure making the investment, you know, to see, um, you know, where we can do better uh, and and putting real resources behind it. Um, this question is not about an issue per se, as much as it is about your experiences personally. Uh, and we want to talk about the challenges of being an African-American woman mayor. Um, and I'm going to start with Mayor Cantrell, and I'm going to tell you a story. And listen, I typically don't call people out, and I'm not now calling with somebody out by name, but I'm just going to name names. When you were trying to get this infrastructure money and you was trying to get this tourism money, I remember specifically listening to the radio. And Steve Perry was all, well, she don't know how this process works and she don't understand how to, we don't do it like that and blah, blah, blah. But the way that he was speaking about your request um, to me, I was like, oh, would he talk about it like this if this was not Mary Cantrell? I'm sorry, the, the head of tourism, Steve Perry at that time, uh, when you're trying to get the tourism money to direct, uh, to put toward our infrastructure needs, just the way you are discussed a lot of times on talk radio. I just wonder if to you, you think that there are any unique challenges um, being an African-American woman mayor. And then do you uh, feel like, you know, a lot of times the the criticism may be sharper, or the, you know, the comments may be a little harder or, or, or the conversation is different as it pertains to you because of this? Well, Gina, thank, thank you for that. And it's, it, and it's not even that I feel. It's evident. I know. You know, it's I evident know. in how um, I'm discussed, how I'm reported on, um, and constantly questioned simply because you are Black and you're a woman. And no matter what the decision is, immediately it's called into question. And, and, and the way that you're talked about is if you have no feelings, no family, and you don't know what you're doing. And every step of the way, no matter how you have demonstrated that you can face a challenge head on, get results facing that challenge to fix it. But it's like with every challenge that comes after, you have to start from scratch all over again. It's almost as you're starting as a deficit, having to prove that you are up for the challenge, although you've proven 
time and time and time again that you can face it to fix it. Um, but it's very interesting and it happens all the time. And even as I think, you know, Gail Benson yesterday dropped off, she signed the, um, the newspaper, two newspaper articles based on the reelection. And there was one article, I actually hadn't even looked at it. And when I saw Gail sign it, and I said, well, why did, why did my picture have to look like this? Why did they have to pick the worst picture ever? Talking about a mayor that was reelected, that's the leader of a city, but the worst picture ever? And you tell me that there were no other pictures? So these things don't happen just because. And it is, um, it, it's something that, um, you know, you have to deal with. It can be traumatizing, but at the same time, you know, I'm here to do a job and I'm here to do that with integrity, uh, with respect. And I do, um, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's very interesting and, and it is different. And I believe that if I was a man and if even if I was a white man, I wouldn't be talked about in the same way. And, uh, but regardless, you know, I'm a woman, I'm a black woman and I'm confident in doing the job that I've demonstrated and um, we'll continue to bring people along because people can look at you one way, but it's how you carry yourself and how you do the job and how you move that, really speaks for itself. And it's about serving the people. And I just hope that I'm just a, a great example of how, you know, I can love on you anyway, and just stay focused and not be distracted uh, by the negativity. And I have to say, Gina, you know, it's a time in society right now that's even worse than what we've experienced, I believe, you know, even a decade ago. Um, people are very much more aggressive, and they are mean, and mean spirited. And they don't hold back and they feel like they can talk to you any kind of way and you're just supposed to lay back and take it and not be respected. But we have to demand respect because we do deserve that. And um, and that's what I'll say on, about it right now. Mayor Kendrall, you know, listen, I, you will rarely find me in the uh, elected official amen corner. I promise you this. But I have seen this play out having covered several mayors. Um, you know, I've seen the disparity play out with my own eyes. And so I know it's not, oh, you feel, I've, I've seen it. Uh, and, you know, you're right. Some of the ways in which people discuss you or, you know, you know, talk, question your decision making, particularly, I remember even with COVID-19, oh my goodness, you know, when all you were trying to do was keep people safe. And there was so much chatter and so much to say and so many questions and you were being driven by the data. Mayor President, um, talk about your experience. You know, I lived in Baton Rouge for a while. Uh, it can, <laughs> not the easiest place all the time. Uh, talk about your experience uh, as a black woman mayor um, in Baton Rouge. Well, uh, my sister mayor and I, we share very similar experiences. I, I have a, I, you know, on the journey, I'm going to write several books, and I could definitely uh, write one book just focused on this question. Uh, I have been in elected office now for 32 years, um, and I have seen uh, politics evolve over the uh, past 32 years. Uh, when I became the CEO of this city and parish, I was really caught off guard, I will tell you, and did not expect the onslaught of sexism and racism that I have experienced. It is not anything concocted. You can write a, you can do the research yourself, just like that picture uh, Mayor Cantrell showed. It happens frequently compared. I encourage, in fact, Gina, I would love to see a communication student take this on as a project, right? Uh, because it's very evident, not only just in how we are portrayed in the media, uh, but for example, uh, I never will forget, someone said to one of my senior staff members when they came in for one of my, uh, for a meeting with me, 
do you trust her leadership? Do you trust her leadership? Now, would they have ever said that about an Anglo-Saxon male? I doubt it very seriously. Uh, and then I have given speeches. Granted, I have a great uh, communications team, but you know, I have two degrees in communications. I've been writing speeches since I was in high, before high school. So I know how to write a speech. And so I stayed up. You're uh, my professor. Yeah. So, you know, I stayed up in the waning hours one night writing one of my state of the city addresses, gave it, delivered it. And then afterwards, some uh, a male, white male came up to my white male CAO and said, oh, you did a great job writing her speech. Uh, you know, what is that kind of stuff about? And not only that, but the, the constant uh, you know, criticism, and it's even beyond criticism, it's ugly, you know, uh, it's, it's very ugly. Some of the portrayals, some of the names, uh, you know, I, I know my, my team has to block out some stuff that I guess they don't, you know, they think is totally inappropriate that people say, you know, people are, are, are cowardly uh, get on social media and call you everything but a child of God. That's right. But they won't say that, you know what? I, I went to a game, uh, uh, a football game recently. My staff doesn't even know about this. And these uh, people were out there tailgating and a couple of them started calling me by my first name. Hey, Sharon, hey, Sharon, uh, what you're doing at the game? You need to be uh, doing something about crime in the community. Totally out of order, totally disrespectful. But you know what? I went up to them and I said, now share again with me what, what you have to say. You know, they got a little quieter, but then they said, so I said, you know what? Why don't you set up a meeting with me and come talk to me about it in my office? I have 15 minutes with the mayor. You're welcome to come down. They didn't want to do that, you know? And then at the end, I just said, you know, God bless you and kept on move, kept it moving. But this kind of, these kind of experiences do not happen with our white counterparts, especially our white male counterparts. They don't do that kind of stuff. You can't tell me that they, that happens all the time. Maybe there's an element of it. But the, you know, but the reason why we keep going is because we know the people who fought for us to get in these That's right. We know that they didn't have it easy. And so, you know, we don't get weary in well-doing but we keep pressing towards the mark. We keep it going, we keep it, we are focused, I'm focused on a vision and a mission for this city. And I'm not gonna let anybody deter me, delay me, or uh, do anything to try to uh, uh, keep me from accomplishing these goals. It's public service. That's right. My, my dear friend, and although things have gotten a little challenging, my dear friend, who, went home to be with the Lord, my best friend. She used to always say, public service is not for the faint of heart. Well, these days, public service for African-American women is definitely not for the faint of heart. And thank God for, you know, a network of sister friends mm -hmm. like Mayor Cantrell, where we can talk and encourage each other mm -hmm. uh, on this journey. And sometimes I need to hear from her. Sometimes she need to hear from me. That's right. We got to encourage each other on this journey. That's right. I would also recommend that people read a book by one of my good friends, Dr. Lori Martin. She's written a book on Black women as leaders. So if you have not read that book, I encourage you to make it a part of your library. But it is a different journey and is not anything concocted. It is reality. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm just so inspired listening to uh, both of you guys talk because, uh, you know, I'm sorry, both mayors talk because, you know, I know it's about the servant leadership and I know that there's something bigger than somebody, you know, talking crazy to you or what have you, you know, and it's so funny. Somebody asked me the other day if I would ever consider running for politics. And I was like, oh, you know, I would be a distraction because the first time somebody came at me some kind of any kind of way, that would be the headline. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I just can't imagine, you know, being talked to in the way that I've seen it play out. Um, you know, Mary Cantrell, I just want to ask you this. Just recently, somebody came at you in a way that wasn't appropriate. 
And, you know, the community was like, a lot of community was like, yeah, TV, he deserved everything you told him because that was disrespectful. When you look back on that exchange, uh, is that kind of uh, indicative of what you're talking about? The exchange with the guy at the uh, Windsor Court, is that a- indicative of the experiences that you're talking about, Mayor Cantrell? Um, no, that that's, that's a part of it. That was uh, one uh, incident that I did experience uh, where it was, it was so disrespectful that I had to uh, say, hey, here I am, you know, there I go. <laughs> you know, you're talking about me, but I'm right here and I'm so accessible, you know, and, and that's uh, what prompted me to just um, to go and, and, and whatever he had to say that he could absolutely tell me. Uh, but it's that level of disrespect, but also it just plays out. I know there was a recent piece in the gambit and it was like the ma'ams or something they call, you know, it's the office of yes, ma'ams, you know, it's just, it's things that are just disre- downright disrespectful and inappropriate um, that, that just should not be. And, um, but you know what? We cannot be distracted um, as Mayor Broom said. And it was that one incident, I have to say, I did, I did respond, but I'm being more cautious. You know, I put myself on time out even, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, it, it clearly didn't affect how the voters felt. <laughs> and we saw the results of that. Um, I want to say this. We have a question from Kendara Jordan. Um, she wants to know what advice you would have. I mean, knowing the reality of this, I heard Mayor President say this is not for the faint at heart. Both of you have given your account of just, you know, the difficulties that you have experienced. Uh, Mayor President Broom, we will start with you. Uh, for people who really want to do this, who really want to get into public service and, you know, think that they can make a difference in this realm, what advice would you give when faced with this, you know, other issue that has nothing to do with, you know, making good policy or trying to make a difference for somebody or improve the quality of life, but it is a real factor you will have to contend with as a Black woman entering uh, politics or uh, any other high profile field. What, What advice, Mayor President, do you have? Well, first of all, you should know who you are and yes. be secure in who you are. Yes. Um, you know, I always love to mentor uh, the up and coming leaders in our community. Um, I will say that uh, I often ask one question What is your motivation? Why do you want to run for office? Now, because you can serve in a lot of different areas in government. You can be in elected office, you can be in appointed office, you know, or you might want to choose a different path of entrepreneurship. But specifically when people come to me about wanting to wanting to run for office, I ask, why, why is it that you want to run? What is your motivation? And so I usually can discern by that answer um, individuals who are motivated by a call to public service. Because I remember when I first ran, I distinctly in my heart felt that call to public service Mm -hmm. that I could be helpful and do something about what was not happening in my community. And I will say very humbly, I think that, you know, while my calling is certainly contingent upon being elected during over these years, I believe the longevity of this call Uh, certainly substantiates the fact that it is a calling. It's not about a title. It's not about a position, but it's about really having your heart in service. Mayor Cantrell started out as a, a community advocate and because she was concerned about her community. It was not that she was seeking a title, but she was concerned about her community. But that calling continued to evolve. Mm-hmm. I often remind her of when I, I first saw her at a fundraiser that I had in New Orleans. And I remember her saying that it was her desire uh, to run for mayor one day. And I never forgot that. And also I believed 
um, that her calling was evolving even when I, I saw her and really didn't know her, but I, I could see that it was evolving then. And so my encouragement to anyone who wants to pursue public office, especially elected office, examine, first of all, know who you are, be secure in who you are, and then examine why you want to run for office. Because uh, Lord knows, I'm so thankful for the team that I had that, uh, you know, they don't want to run for office, but they want to help me, you know. And so that's so vitally important as well, being a member of the team. Uh, so uh, that's that's my final words, encouragement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mayor Cantrell, the question is to you. Uh, what advice would you have, particularly knowing the challenges that you've endured, experienced as a Black woman, uh, for other young Black women who want to run for political office or assume some type of high-profile role, knowing that, unfortunately, there will be this criticism and harshness and downright ugliness at times waiting for them uh, when, in essence, people really get into service most of the time to do good. Uh, but at the same time, you know, this is just part of the things you'll have to continue. What's your advice here? Well, what I will say is that the issues that um, are plaguing our community and particularly even the most vulnerable, whether it's, you know, housing, wages, child care, education and the like, um, Black women, unfortunately, kind of make up that disparity and are in that gap. So it is incumbent upon us as Black women to be willing and be courageous to step out to serve. It's necessary. And I agree 100% with uh, my sister mayor. You have to know who you are. And when you know who you are, then you can stand in the midst of any adversity that comes your way. It's almost, and be rooted in faith and grounded in faith. I know I am. I know that Mayor Broom is a woman of strong faith. And so with that, it's like, hey, you're grounded and you're like, okay, take your best shot because you know who you are and then you know whom, whom you are as well. And I mean, I have an altar in my office. I, I'm not just talking it. I, I believe that, but that's, that's what I lean on to continue to build myself up and to reassure myself that I am not alone in this. And it's through the partnerships and the mentorships, even that Mayor Broom spoke about, that allows us to build each other up and be supportive to when you're wanting to be a leader in the community period you know it doesn't start with an elected office i don't think it should i think you should kind of acclimate yourself to the community know who you're serving and why you're wanting to serve them in an elected capacity because we need people who are willing to be courageous once they are elected and not go along to get along because we don't need that. That that doesn't bring about the changes that we need to see to deal with the majority of folks that fall in those gaps of disparity. Um, and so I would say you don't have to wait to run, you know, or you don't have to wait to serve. You can do it now. Find out where your passions lie. Make sure, I would say, that your passions are aligned with the actions that you want to see, because then it's not a job. Like, it's a calling. And so for me, I believe in this role. I'm where I'm supposed to be and at the right time. And I get up every morning. I'm invigorated. I'm excited about the challenges, and I face them uh, willingly in spite of some of the, um, you know, things that we're talking about, you know, how you're perceived, but you let your, your actions speak for themselves. And I think uh, knowing who you are is the first step in that regard. I think that's the most important thing because not everyone's going to like you, you know, not everyone's going to agree with you. Um, people will try to attack you, but when you know who you are, it gives you a, a protection that is very hard to even explain. I just know that that protection exists and it's out there for you as well. Wow, I just have to say, you know, I, I, I know both of you has, have built this thing from the ground up. 
really from the ground up from like, you know, being involved in the community, in the community, grassroots, touching people and affecting the lives of people. Nobody, you know, just gets to be the mayor, particularly, you know, black women just on happenstance. Right. Uh, I, I think about how Mayor Weston Broom said everything, you know, has to have some type of intentionality uh, behind it. Mayor Cantrell saying just knowing who you are and who you're serving. I mean, I'm not going to lie. And the media, in terms of government, sometimes there can be an adversarial relationship. But I want to tell you, I mean, and not even necessarily, it's just one of those things that kind of just goes along with it. Uh, and we all understand that it's not personal. But I want to tell you on a personal level to both of you, just how much I admire um, what you have done. I, I find it so inspirational to sit here uh, and listen to you talk about policy and how you really uh, have a heart to, you know, make lives better for the communities and the people that you serve. Um, we, but when we talk about, you know, how the atmosphere can sometimes get a little testy, how do you shield, this is my last question, but how do you shield your family from this? I mean, because you're not, doing this in the vacuum right you are married you have children and so you may be able to handle it or you may be able so okay how do you shield that how do you shield them from this yeah well i don't think there is a shield um i know um how i really uh, no, are you still with me yeah, I'm here. I, I, there was some tech issues going on in and out, but you know, I I have a husband and I have a daughter. Um, I teach my daughter. Listen, I know that she is on social media. That's that she's grown up in it. You know, that's her world. Um, but I also really say, look, you know, don't read in all those comments. Don't even look at it. I mean, we have to protect our own mental health. And my way is I don't even indulge. I don't read it at all. And it's all my, when you don't read it, you don't even know what they're saying. It doesn't matter because you have to stay focused, but it all go, also goes back to the points that, that we, made we made earlier. earlier. The best that I can do for my child is strengthening her self-confidence, allowing her to know who she is, making sure that she's spiritually grounded. Um, and that's where I start as a mom, you know, and, and just as a parent. And with my husband as well, I have to tell him, look, get off that social media as, you know, too, because it can become a problem, you know, and, and that's something that I really work hard to prevent my family from having uh, to endure. But it's, it goes back to knowing who we are as a family, as a unit, and why I'm in this position to serve and what responsibility comes along with that. Mayor President. Yes, um, I, you know, I have a husband, three children, and three grandchildren. And so all of our children are grown. So they're pretty, they're able to handle, they understand, you know, what uh, what's going on, and uh, they know how to handle it. They've grown up in the political uh, arena with, uh, with me. Uh, uh, what I try not to do is uh, dump on my husband. <laughs> when I come home, I try to use that space for us to, you know, talk about, I talk about his day, you know, he, he teaches, he's at LSU. So I talk about his day. Then I talk a little bit about my day, but I don't, you know, tell him everything that I've experienced or everything sometimes that, that, that I'm feeling. And uh, my oldest uh, granddaughter, I, uh, she's she's grown up too, you know, in the political arena. I have had to um, caution her. Uh, only one time, I uh, witnessed her. Uh, <laughs> I witnessed her not really uh, giving the type of response to one of my opponents that I expected of her. Uh, you know, one of my ex opponents spoke to her and she barely spoke back and I had to say hey 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 that's not how we roll around here <laughs> you know I was watching her so uh she she's she's now much older she's not much older but she's older she's, she's in college so she gets it you know I think both Mayor Cantrell and I have established an environment for our families by the way we lead and uh, uh, and I believe that they uh, they understand it, and they, you know it's just great to have a supportive family. 
I want to thank um, both mayors for your time today. I know when you are running major cities that you don't often get to carve out two hours on a Friday to sit on exactly. the internet, and, you know, and talk to Gina Swanson and company. But I, I do think that it's important uh, for people who were uh, interacting uh, along with this virtual summit. I just wanted to read some of the comments. Daisy Taylor uh, says that you are the best. I love your leadership. Um, and, you know, I can't express how thankful I am for the hard work you do for the people of New Orleans. That's what she, Daisy Taylor said. And then um, also she goes on to say, you know what, for all three of us, that she's appreciative of all of us. Michael uh, Downman, he says that both mayors are awesome and classy leaders. And I feel like that's a place to, a good place to stop. Like both of you are awesome, courageous, bold. Um, you know, we know that you're historic and trailblazers. And, and, and I just want to give you your flowers and your credit for everything that you have done. Uh, you know, on behalf of serving people. I, I, don't, I mean, I know that you already have a lot of accolades, both of you, but I just don't think that I can say it enough. Um, the admiration I have, particularly as a black woman. So, you know, my reporter hat on the other side, if I, you know, have to ask a question, you know, you don't know, like, I know it's not personal, but I just personally, this is um, just how much I appreciate you and seeing your faces running things in our two major cities. Um, with that, oh, and Bridget Cozy says that this is a profound and necessary summit. Um, with that, I'm just gonna, if you, if either mayors have any final or closing thoughts or final remarks, we've covered everything. We covered COVID, we covered the economy, we talked about police, we talked about crime, education, social issues. I mean, we covered it all. But if there are any final thoughts or any last words, this is an opportunity uh, for you to express them at Mayor Cantrell. Well, no, Gina, I just want to say thank you. You know, you are your role model as well. And I've watched you through the years and, and in the media um, community, you're, you're a leader amongst it. And you make us proud here in the city of New Orleans. You should know that. And also, I wanted to say, and I know um, Ms. Bridget mentioned that this summit was necessary. I have to say it really was, and I appreciate being a part of it with my sister mayor, uh, Sharon Western Broom, and I take my hat off to Southern University, you know, for making this possible. And I think that's what made me commit to two, almost two and a half hours. Well, I'll say two hours because I was 15 minutes late uh, to this because when Southern approached, I really could not, I could not say no um, in understanding the value and the asset that Southern uh, is in the state of Louisiana. So thank you for allowing me to participate and uh, we just look forward to a continued partnership. Uh, Mayor President, any final thoughts? Yes, I um, ditto everything that Mayor Cantrell said and I will just add once again, I appreciate Southern University for allowing this uh, dialogue to take place. Uh, communication is so critical to advancing our communities and I believe this type of platform certainly gives us a more formidable way to share not only our experiences, but our vision uh, for our communities. Thank you, Gina. Uh, glad to see one of my former students at work doing great things. And so my encouragement to everyone, and I, I once again, I'm so delighted to be on this uh, panel with my sister, Mayor, Mayor Cantrell. We're gonna do, continue to do great things for both of our cities. Uh, but I would just encourage those individuals to get involved um, in your community, get involved in your community. There's lots of work to do. And uh, we welcome you as a part of changing the trajectory for, as we say, a community of peace, prosperity, and progress. Wow. Thank you so much. Before I let everyone go, I just also have to acknowledge, as we talked about Southern University, we have to you know, acknowledge the following departments at SUNO, the Center for African and African American Studies, Lyceum, the Public Relations Department, and the Student Affairs and Student Government Association uh, at SUNO for helping to make all of this possible. Again, thank you for carving this time out of your busy schedule uh, and having this talk with us. Uh, I certainly appreciate it. I was enlightened. And y'all don't have no problem checking the media about where we can be better partners. And so I'm always going to be aware of that moving forward when we tell stories that's going to be in the back of my mind. Now, Mayor President, Mayor Cantrell was like, well, if the media <laughs> would, you know, be better partners than we can be. 
and we can be. At least, you know, I can speak for myself. Can't speak for everybody. Well, and we don't want to dump on the we don't want to dump on the the, the African American sister who's a part of me as well. We going we'll be able to tell it to your your white counterparts. <laughs> okay, thank you for your time again, and that's gonna conclude our summit. Happy Thanksgiving. Be safe, uh, and and I just appreciate it. This was a much needed, wonderful conversation, and this is a perfect note to end it. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right.